Welcome to Get the Balance Right, a podcast for creative entrepreneurs who challenge the status quo. I'm your host, Heather Zeitzwolf, and I'm on a mission to help and inspire visionaries to grow their firms with a keen focus on their triple bottom line. Join me for conversations with purpose-driven leaders, business disruptors, CEOs, and renegades in digital media, marketing, advertising, and design. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Get the Balance Right Podcast. I am your host, Heather Zeitzwolf. On today's show, you are in for a real treat. We are joined by Todd Churches. He recently published a book, which I would say is a must-read business book, called Visual Leadership, Leveraging the Power of Visual Thinking in Leadership and in Life. Now, whether you are an entrepreneur or somebody who leads teams, this book is totally jam-packed with techniques and ways to approach problems to find solutions through visual thinking. Going far beyond sticky notes on a whiteboard, this book was years in the making and a culmination of thousands of business books Todd has read over the years. Besides this wonderful book, Todd is a CEO and co-founder of Big Blue Gumball. It's a New York City-based consulting firm specializing in leadership development, public speaking, and executive coaching. He is also a three-time award-winning adjunct professor of leadership at NYU and lectures on leadership at Columbia University. And if that wasn't enough, he is also a TEDx speaker alum and is preparing for his next TED Talk scheduled for 2021. I want to personally thank Todd again for being on my show. Thanks, Todd. I feel lucky and honored that you were on my podcast. All right, everybody. Here is my conversation about the power of visual thinking with Todd Churches. Todd Churches, welcome to my podcast. Heather, thanks for having me. This was great. I've been so enjoying your book, Visual Leadership. We're going to dive into that a little bit. But before we jump in, you are not only a writer, you're a professor, an executive coach, and a TEDx alum. I'd love to unpack all of these. Can you just tell the audience a little bit about where and what you teach? Sure. I teach at NYU in Columbia in New York. So at NYU, I teach leadership and team building in the human capital management, which is basically HR master's program. And at Columbia, I taught in the strategic communications master's program, but I also guest lecture in a number of other programs, including I teach leadership for Broadway stage managers in the MFA theater program. So I get to use a lot of show tunes and I, I majored, I was an English literature major as an undergrad so with the concentration in Shakespeare and poetry. So I get to incorporate the humanities and the arts and literature and theater into that class. So as much as I love my HR students and my NYU program, I get to have a little bit of a uh, different kind of fun in the Columbia program lecture. And I've been doing that for seven years. This will be my seventh year coming up. And at NYU, I've been teaching for 10 years. Wow, that is so cool. Okay, I'm going to stay on the subject of what we're talking about, because otherwise I would just want to talk about musical theater. Well, it all ties together. It's all about storytelling, right? Everything I do. So whether it's my TED Talk, my book, it's all about stories. Tell us about your business that you have being an executive coach. Sure. My company is called Big Blue Gumball, one word with a capital B, B, and G. And we do management and leadership consulting, training, and coaching. Everything from basically soft skills. So I don't do negotiation or sales or strategy or anything related to the business side, or definitely not the numbers side. I leave that to people like yourself who are experts in that. So I'm all about soft skills. I'm all about how do you get the best, the most and the best out of people, whether it's through one-on-one -on -one coaching, small teamwork, or through working with managers and leaders from the C-suite on down to first-time managers. I love working with first-time managers who've never managed before. It's, hey, you're a good salesperson. Why don't you head up, become head of sales? Or you're a good IT person. You're now the manager of marketing it's or uh, IT or whatever. Managing and leading is a very different skill set than doing what you're doing. There's a lot of a never ending amount of work in that area to help people become effective at getting things done through and with other people. This big blue gumball, what is there a story behind that name? There's a long story, but the short version is we do a lot of work around metaphor and analogy. The metaphor is that the world, the earth, the globe is like a big blue gumball. However you want to take it, that's up to you. It's just our fun, quirky name that represents who we are and and how we do what we do, which is all around, again, visual thinking, storytelling, and metaphor to get people. And our catchphrase is, how do you get people to see what you're saying? 
how do you get an idea out of your head into someone else's? And a big part of that is the foundation of the visual leadership work that I do that's in my book and my TED Talk and, and all my teaching and consulting work. This TED Talk that you gave was a little while back. Now you have the book. Was the TED Talk the inspiration for your book? It's all tied together. I applied to do a TED Talk like five times. I was rejected five times or four times before. And in fact, the fourth time, I was one of 11 finalists and they came back and said, all right, we're going with 10. And guess who was number 11? But what I did was instead of just sour grapes, I ended up going to the TEDx event and I met the organizer and she introduced me to a guy named Nikos Marco, who is going to be organizing a TEDx in New York City. And just from her introducing me, I met him and I applied like everyone else, but I got chosen and I did my TEDx. So it was actually last last year, so 2019. And I actually got asked to do a second TEDx talk in 2020, but it was canceled due to the pandemic and postponed till 2021. So hopefully it'll be coming up live this spring if we could all get back to normal. For your TEDx talk, were you presenting different ideas each time or was it the same talk? Now, the first talk is on the power of visual thinking. So that's very much tied into my book. And my key concept is the rhyming words, attention, comprehension, and retention. When you use visual thinking, visual communication, visual imagery, and visual language, it captures people's attention because it gets them to focus. If I show you something, you'll say, oh, let me look at that. I have your attention. Comprehension is understanding, right? If I show you something as opposed to just telling you about it, you're going to understand it better. And retention Brain science just shows that when we take in information visually, it increases our memory and recall. So that's the concept of attention, comprehension, retention. So how can we use visual language to get people to focus, understand, and remember? That's the foundation of everything we do, whether you're doing a TEDx talk or talking one-on-one or speaking in front of a group of you know, 100,000 people. I believe it was in your TEDx talk and in your book that you talked about as a child, your first career that you wanted to have was Superman. And if that didn't work out, then Batman was your follow-up. Exactly. Are you still that into superheroes or was that a childhood thing? No, I still have not outgrown that. I'm still into superheroes, but I love origin stories and I love world origins. I love mythology. I love learning how people started, even talking to people about their careers. If I asked you how the what you're doing right now, is this what you envisioned 10 or 15 or 20 years ago? It'd be interesting to find out yes or no, and how you got to where you are. So I love origin stories. But as a kid, all kids love superheroes. I used to grab my mother's dish towel and strap it on and fly around the house growing up. What's interesting, as a coach, I try to save people and be, help them be more successful. So it's like Superman, instead of having x-ray vision, I have the power of visual thinking. That's my superpower. And like Batman, he had his utility belt with the bad boomerang and all that kind of stuff. I have all the visual leadership tools, tips, and techniques in my coaching toolkit. So in a way, I'm reliving my Superman and Batman fantasies through my executive coaching work. I love that. Hey there, this is Heather. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. And if you are, if you wouldn't mind, please hit the subscribe button now. That way you'll never miss an episode. All right, now back to the podcast. I think we were probably a lot alike as children because you memorized the TV guide and so did I. Yeah, yeah. So we knew if someone said what's on CBS at Tuesday at 8, we knew what exactly what was on. That used to be my superpower as a child. And how exciting was it when the fall preview issue came out and you got to see all the shows that were coming up starting in September. That was always one of the exciting things for the year as a kid. Let's dive into the topic today, the power of visual thinking. And I want to dive into your book as well. Just to start us off, can you say how you would define visual thinking and how does that relate to leadership? Visual thinking is basically about thinking in pictures. It's that simple. So as opposed to in words, as opposed to in numbers, it's about visualizing things. I mentioned I majored in Shakespeare as an undergrad, as an English literature major. In Hamlet, Shakespeare says, Horatio Hamlet says, I think I see my father in my mind's eye. He wasn't sure if he, the ghost of his father was the, a figment of his imagination or if it was a real apparition. So Shakespeare popularized that phrase to see something in your mind's eye. So when we picture something in our mind's eye, it's so clear. And yet when we try to communicate it to someone else, it may not be. Right. So how do we get that image from our head into someone else's? And if you think about the word imagination, the root of imagination is image. Right. An image is about picture. So we may not even realize how often we use visual language to say, oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Or, you know, I'm just not seeing it. We use that terminology. A lot of my work is around what do you see? What are you looking at? What are you looking for? What are you noticing? What are you watching? Again, it's all about taking information visually. But what's interesting, it's not just taking information through our eyes, but also through our ears. You can hear something. If someone tells 
tells you a story, we visualize it in our mind's eye, almost as if we're watching a movie of it. If someone says, how was your day? Oh, you wouldn't believe what happened to me today. And you start telling that story, you picture it as if it's unfolding before your mind's eye. That's a big part of what we do. So as managers and leaders, as business professionals, that's what we're trying to do is get people to see what we're saying. One of my favorite things to do is brainstorming. When I think of visual leadership and brainstorming, I think about, of course, the traditional whiteboard with the sticky notes. But in your book, you talk about a napkin. There's napkin sketching, there's whiteboarding, there's flip charting. You can use post-it. There's, there's a million different ways to do it. But I think the whole idea is how do you download ideas from your head and onto some medium, whether it's paper or a screen or whatever, so other people can look at it and see what they're saying. Like one of my clients, when we were back in person in offices, they had a, uh, an innovation room. So on the table were like slinkies and Play-Doh and, and Tinker Toys and all that kind of stuff just to go in there and play. And on one of the walls was a whiteboard. We could just go in and write an idea down and someone else may bring in their lunch and see that idea on the wall and say, oh, I'm going to add to it. I'm going to draw a picture around it or, or they'll take a model or a visual framework and add to it. That's the power of using visual imagery. Um, and they break it down to four categories, using visual imagery and pictures and drawing. Category two is using mental models and frameworks. Category three is using metaphors and analogies. And category four is using storytelling with bonus points for humor when appropriate. If you think about it, they all work in combination. But that's, again, the idea is to bring ideas to life and get them out of your head. So the napkin sketching idea is basically about you're talking to someone. Can you pick up a napkin? And it doesn't have to be a napkin. And that's a metaphor. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. Can you sketch something out just so you could say, this is what I'm thinking? And it's a great way to basically start, initiate a communication and get a message across. In the book, you were talking about how I believe it was a client that could not visualize something. And so quickly you were able to put it down in a napkin and then redirected the idea and it all came to light. Yeah, the long story short, this, this client was the vice president of sales for a pharmaceutical company in Europe. And he had a head of the East and head of the West and things weren't working out. And I said, what if instead of East and West, you made it North and South and just divided the country that way and the light bulb went off and that was the solution to his problem. So without going into all the details, but... I almost didn't say it because it was so obvious to me, like I saw it so clearly, but he was too close to it and didn't even cross his mind to redistrict basically his region that way. But that was the solution to his problem. But again, when I drew it out, like the light bulb went off, he saw it in a split second. That's also another great reason to work with a coach because you're so in something and you can't see what's right there in front of you. Exactly. Sometimes knowing less is actually a benefit because you don't, you're not clouded by all the complexity and simplifying complexity is something that visual thinking helps to do. There's a lot in your book that I want to try to get to. I'm going to jump around a little bit. So you have this one technique. I'm going to call it technique. I don't know if you call it technique, but stop, start, continue, magic wand. Can you explain a little bit about that one? Sure. So I'll explain it visually. So if you picture a, a traffic light, there's a red light, a yellow light, and a green light, right? Same thing. So stop, start, continue is a technique that could be used in a, a lot of different situations. Real life example with my NYU students, at the midterm point, I ask for feedback. How are we doing? So I have them do a stop, start, continue. What are we doing in the class? I usually start with the yellow. What are we doing that's working, right? Yellow is continue, keep going. So what do you want us to keep doing? Is there anything we're doing that you don't like that's not productive? That's red light. Let's stop doing that because is just not helpful or it's not worthwhile or valuable. Green light is what should we start doing? What should we hit go on that maybe we had on the to-do list but we haven't gotten to yet? So that's the stop, start, continue. But you could, even as I'm explaining it, I'm sure you're picturing that red, yellow, green. We've all seen the traffic light, right? So it's a common reference point. You now will remember that because of the visual nature. And the magic wand question I, I ask is if we can wave a magic wand and change something literally in a second, what would it be? If you could pick, if you had one wish. And then I say, all right, unfortunately, there is no magic wand. However, let's see if we could work on this. But it's good to just open it like blue sky. If anything was possible, what would it be? Because you may not be able to get the ideal thing, but you may be able to get something close. So that's the magic wand principle in action. So I use them in combination and it tends to be very effective. So I use that with my coaching clients. I use it with my students. And it's just a, a very simple, but very powerful tool. There's another chapter where you talk about how being a quitter can make you a winner. I remember as a kid wanting to quit dancing class and my mom did not want to let me quit, but really I wanted to do other things. Can you explain what you mean by this? That was actually triggered by one of my students who asked Asked me because she was wrestling with this. She started reading a book and she was found it really boring and, and useless and unproductive, even though it was a famous book. She wanted to just put it aside and start reading something else, but she was channeling her father, telling her, once you start something, you got to finish it. Otherwise, that makes you a quitter. And I said, you know, being a quitter makes you a winner because why 
struggle for hours, waste all this valuable time doing something that you have no interest in rather than doing something that you do. So there's no downside and no shame in walking out of a bad movie or putting down a bad book. Or I could see that with like piano lessons or dance lessons or something. Sometimes people may quit prematurely before really giving it a chance because of failure. So that's the flip side of quitting too soon is you want to give it your all and see maybe you could develop this talent. And then my passion skill matrix model, which is in the book, which is my most popular model, sometimes we're in that failure zone. Is it we don't like it because we're not good at it or we're not good at it because we don't like it. And maybe if we got better at it, we would like it more. And then you inch your way up into the growth zone and eventually into your sweet spot. Again, it's a judgment call, but frameworks and models like this do not solve your problem for you, but they give you a way to simplify the complexity and think it through so you can make a better and more informed decision. There are many stories of people who gave up too soon and other stories where people push through and they end up becoming a success once they got over that initial obstacle or hump. That's the idea behind being a quitter makes you a winner. Again, it's situational, but you have to know when to just cut your losses and move on to something else. One of the other things in your book that I thought was really interesting is following the rules and breaking the rules. Now, I'm, of course, I'm an accountant, so I have to follow the rules, but I'm a total rebel. And so I'm all about breaking the rules too, when it's appropriate. Can you explain a little bit about what you mean? I think it's a balance. I am not a rule follower at all. I do not respond to authority well, which is why I've been fired a couple of times. That's the thing. There's a whole concept called rule conformity. Some people like rules are rules, laws are laws, authority is authority. I need to just follow. That's what mentality. A lot, of, a lot of it has to do with culture, our upbringing, and our personality. And other people are rebellious. And I make my own rules. I go down my own path. Now, sometimes, like you said, with accounting, there are rules, policies, principles, laws that you have to abide by, but you find your creativity and innovation within that and find your own path. Realize your relationship with rules. And are you a rule breaker, a rule maker? and then that will help to guide your decisions. Because but sometimes people struggle with things because not all rules made sense. And that's saying rules were meant to be broken for a reason. So that's, again, a judgment call. But the idea behind it is just to get you thinking about it and to make better, more informed and intelligent and productive decisions. In your book, you talk about some really funny stories about when you were working in the film industry and one particular boss that you had that was really horrible. Uh, Unfortunately, I had a boss that was like that as well, but your boss actually threw a box of pens at you? Yeah, it just missed my head by inches. But yes, instead of sitting at my desk typing up a memo and my boss's door flung open and I felt something whipped by my head and she turned out she had thrown a box of pens at me and they scattered all over my desk and all over the floor. And it was because they were the wrong ones. She wanted the fine point. These were the medium point. And and I say in my NYU class when we're teaching deliver feedback as a manager, I pose that question. I don't know. Is there any other way you might have given your employee feedback that they got the wrong pens? Nope. I can't think of anything. I think that's the only solution. Unfortunately, in the Hollywood industry, there are a lot of Harvey Weinsteins and Harriet Weinsteins and people where their power and ego goes to the head. And I think people could get away with that less now than they used to back then. But that was just one. I actually started keeping an abuse log because it became such a recurring thing almost on a daily basis, the verbal abuse. Then she just said, pick up the pens. And she started yelling at me. If you can't even order pens, maybe you better find yourself another job. And it's turned out I ordered the right ones. The uh, office supplies people sent up the wrong one. But again, you know, let's keep things in perspective, people, and uh, deliver feedback with a little more empathy and compassion. What I liked, though, was the fact that you actually learned how not to be a manager. <laughs> I've had so many bad bosses. Later on in the book, I had coined the term PTBD, which is post-traumatic boss disorder, which is the flashbacks you get years later from, if someone hands me a box of pens, I duck and I flinch because I get that flash is back from 25 years, 30 years ago. But yeah, what we do as a manager can impact people for life. And Dale Carnegie, who wrote the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, one of his sayings was that the words we say to someone or if what we do, we may forget two minutes later, but it may linger with that other person for the rest of their life. And that's both good stuff and bad stuff. But we really need to be more self-aware about how we're treating people. And that's a big part of the teaching that I do in my NYU course. This is Heather Zeitzwolf. If you are an entrepreneur who is serious about wanting to make a positive impact on the planet, then I have a program for you. It's called the People Planet Profit Roadmap. It's a three month intensive program for entrepreneurs who want to be more focused on their triple bottom line. The program will guide you to make your business more sustainable and will develop an action plan to empower you as a conscious leader. If you are interested in this program, go down to the show notes and you'll find a link to set up a discovery call with me, Heather. All right, now back to the show. 
What made you go from the film industry into teaching and writing books and all of that? Yeah, it's a long career journey. We always talk about having a career path as if it's some walk in the park with stepping stones laid out for us. It's not a career path. It's a career roller coaster of ups and downs, twists and turns, exhilarating highs and terrifying plummets. My dream was to work in television once I got over the Superman, Batman thing. I always was fascinated by television. Believe it or not, I talk loud and I talk fast because I'm a New Yorker, but I'm an extreme introvert. I always say I'm a three B's guy, a back of the room, behind the scenes bookworms. So much of what I do pushes myself way beyond my comfort zone. But after years of working in the TV industry, the problem was I always had assistant level jobs, like assistant to the manager of comedy or drama development or whatever. I never was able to break through to get a manager job because I didn't have the confidence and I didn't have the personality type, what you really needed to make it in Hollywood. So after a while, I gave up after being rejected for promotions. And I got into the theme park business as a project manager. And after 10 years in LA, I moved back to New York for personal reasons. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And I ended up with a job at a training company where they asked me to oversee revamping their mini MBA program. And even though I didn't have an MBA, I have a master's degree in communication and a bachelor's in English. I learned everything there was or I could about management and leadership through reading one book after another. So I started reading one management book after another at that time, and that was 1998, not to give away my age, but over the next 20 years, from 1998 to 2018, I read an average of one business book a week, which is 50 a year. You're the math person, you could do the math. That's over a thousand management books I've read over the last 20, now it's 22 years, so it's probably closer to 1100. And people finally said, you've read all these books, when are you gonna write your own book? But yeah, that's how I ended up going from the TV industry to management leadership leadership training and ultimately teaching, which is not something I ever envisioned doing, but someone approached me from NYU through a connection and said, would you be interested in teaching a course based on the Leadership Institute that I created for the, my former company? Also, you do public speaking as an introvert. Is that tough for you? It's now part of my comfort zone, but it took many years. Literally, in all my years of high school, junior high school, college, and graduate school, I never once spoke. If I was called on, I would respond, but I never raised my hand. I would never get up in front of the room ever. So for me to be doing TEDx talks and teaching at NYU and Columbia, and I could speak right now in front of a thousand or more people or do these podcasts and it's just natural and comfortable now. But it took a long time to get to this point. This is not who I am by nature. I always talk about two Ps, passion and purpose. If you're passionate about something, you want to talk about it. If you have a sense of purpose, and part of my purpose is helping to make the world a better place, one leader at a time. And to me, everyone is a leader. It's my way of giving back to the world. If I can help people be better managers, there are going to be few people suffering the, the abuse of horrible bosses that I suffered, right? So this is my way of giving back in a proactive way. I like in your book, you have the 10 tough questions that leaders should ask themselves. Is this something that you came up with or is this something you work with your clients with? It's something that kind of evolved. But yes, I came up with those questions. They evolved from like, how do you define leadership, right? There's a million different definitions. Some people say leadership is creating followership. Some people say leadership is having a vision and making that vision a reality. Some people say leadership is developing the next generation of leaders, leading with empathy, compassion. So everyone has different words they associate. My book title, Visual Leadership, it's one single word with a shared capital L, and it represents the fact that who we are and how we lead is inseparable from the lens through which we see the world. So that's the concept, but that's why it's a single word. And I actually have a trademark. It's now a, a registered service mark that I own after being rejected twice by the U.S. Patent Office. I finally got it approved. So it's both my brand and the name of the book, and it's my approach to, to doing things. And if you notice on the book cover, it's a rainbow colored eye. The rainbow represents diversity and inclusion in all its forms, as well as innovation and creativity. So as a leader, we need to realize that people do not see the world through the same lens that we do. So one of my concepts is called flipping the eye. We need to turn that eye on ourselves, look inwardly at our biases, assumptions, prejudices, and, and how we see the world and why we see the world that way, as well as trying to see the world with empathy and compassion through the lens of other people who are different from us. So those are some of the foundational, just from the book cover, between the title and the image, there's a whole conversation to be had right there. One of the things that we've been doing on the show has been to talk about my core values that I have for my business and also for the podcast. One of the core values is be authentic, be humble and thankful, make real human connections, own your mistakes and learn from them. And in your book, you had a quote by Eleanor Roosevelt, learn from the mistakes of others. You can't live long enough to make them all yourself. I just wanted you to explain why you put that quote in your book. We learn from mistakes, just like it says. It's like when you read and when you learn and, and talk to other people, storytelling, you know, you can learn success stories or some stories are a cautionary tale. They're failure stories. Like I've learned more from my bad bosses than I did 
did from my few good bosses. I've had a few good ones, a couple of great ones, but I learned how not to match, how not to lead, what it feels like to be on the receiving end of that. Everything's a teachable moment. We always talk about leadership lessons are hiding in plain sight if we're open to looking for them. Um, one of the exercises I do in my NYU class when we're in person, I take the New York Times, I just rip it apart and give out pages to every student. And it's like, on the page you have, find a leadership lesson. And people are like, oh, I don't have the business section. Look in the sports section, look in the arts and leisure, look in the science section. There are literally leadership lessons, not in some articles, but in every single one. If there's a person there, there's some kind of lesson there that we could take, whether it's related to communication or teams or corruption or values. There's always some lesson if we see it and we start to look at the world through that lens of visual leadership. Like even in your, on your, as I was looking at your website, you have, you talk about data visualization and using a dashboard and to, dem to show metrics. And you talk about people, planet, and profit. And you talk about a roadmap, right? The word roadmap, you, you, that's a metaphor, right? It's not a literal open up the, the map or go on Google Maps. It's literally like, what's going to get you from here to there? There's a model called Grow. What's your goal? What's your reality, your current reality? What are some options? And what will you do? G-R-O-W, right? So that's a classic model. So when you talk about getting people from point A to point B or point Z, that's what we do. So you do it through the world of accounting and financials and other people do it in other ways. But it's all about helping people be more successful. And the way in which we do it is what difference, right? But we're all in the business of helping our clients become more successful than they would on their own. In fact, that reminds me of the story about the origin of the word coach. The word coach started out from coaching is like a stage coach or flying coach on a plane. A coach is a vehicle that gets you from point A to point B, right? Better and faster than you would on your own. Just like metaphorical, a business coach would help you do the same thing. I remember reading that in your book. That's in there too. Sometimes I forget what's in there and what's not, because to be honest, I had about 20 years worth of content piled up. So about without exaggeration, about 2000 pages. And a lot of it ends up on the cutting room floor. So I always say the hardest part about designing anything, whether it's a TED talk, a speech, or writing a book or a blog post, deciding what to leave out is many times harder than what to leave in. So sometimes I'll say something like, wait, is that in my book? Well, also what's in your book is a lot of humor too. It's not a dry business book for sure. Thank you. Yeah, my, my three E's are educate, engage, and excite. Educate is what I want people to learn. Engage is how am I going to capture and hold people's attention? And the best way is to entertain and to find humor in everyday situations. And excite is about how do you inspire people to change, to try things differently and to push themselves out of their comfort zone. So that's my company's model, educate, engage, and excite. It's my approach to everything I do. And hopefully that's one of the outcomes of the book is people will be start thinking more visually and start to look at the world in a fresh new way. Todd, thank you so much for being on my podcast. How do people connect with you? Sure. Thank you. Heather. The best way is like my brand new website. I still have my company website, bigbluegumball.com, which is for my training business, but my own personal website, toddchurches.com, launched recently. And you can download my list of my top 52 visual leadership books if you go to my website, toddchurches.com. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I live on LinkedIn. So I'm always there and I'm always happy to engage with people. And also my books available on Amazon or wherever books are sold. This has been great. Thank you so much, Todd. I love it. This was very fun. Thanks for having me. Hey, this is Heather. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast. If you found value in the show, I'd really appreciate it if you gave me a rating on iTunes or just simply tell a friend about it. And if you're interested in learning more about my profit advising and coaching, please set up a discovery call by using the link in the show notes. All right. Thanks so much and see you next time.